Goodness gracious. Real quick, can I get a shy like woohoo if this is your first time at MozCon? All right, see that's the last you guys have been all day. Let's keep that going. So in 2012, I was you, and the first MozCon I came to, I decided that being right here, right now, was gonna be a goal for me. So I pitched, and I failed, and I pitched, and I failed, and finally I pitched, and I get to be here, and I'm super, super excited about that fact. And the moral of the story is, please, please, pitch community slots, wow. All right, but I've got 15 minutes to blow your mind, to potentially change the way you think about not only how you write copy, but the words you put into it. But if we're going to go on that journey together, it's going to start by us agreeing that maybe we've been thinking about copy the wrong way. And here's what I mean by that. When you think about writing a landing page, you probably think about it something like this. You need a headline, you need a strong subheadline that adds to that headline, and then you need a hero image that brings context to all of that. And then in your body copy, yeah, you want to talk about the benefits of your product, and then you need to have a call to action to tell people what to do next, and then you need to have some social proof to give credibility to everything that you just said. And that's not necessarily wrong, but the problem is you can have all of those components and build something totally useless, something that doesn't convert, doesn't have an impact, and doesn't do what you need it to do. And so as a copywriter, I used to think about copy that way, and I started hunting for what I called the holy grail. I wanted to have a framework that any business could use, anyone in any business could use, to go from that white little blinking cursor to writing a page that was intelligently organized and built to convert. And I found it when I realized that every conversion is a conversation. Every conversion is a conversation between the questions in your lead's head that they brought with them and the copy on your page and how well it answers those questions. Answer those questions well and you're on your way to a conversion. Do a bad job of answering those questions and you've potentially lost that conversion. So I did a little bit of digging and I narrowed it down to these six questions. These are the six things every lead comes into the page asking, depending on their level of awareness. So what the heck is this? Who is it for, or maybe better, is it for me? Why should I care, or how will it make my life better? How does this work? What's the process? What's the catch? And if I see how it works, why should I believe a single thing you've told me? And if I do believe a single thing you've told me, what do I need to do next? So if we use this framework to evaluate a landing page, we can see that, hey, here, Unbounce does pretty good. They've answered all of these questions on this landing page for an ebook. We can see, all right, we know exactly what it is. It's an ultimate guide to conversion center design. And then we can see who it's for. We can see why we should care. They've given us the takeaways in the different chapters. Then they've got a video that kind of breaks down how it works, what the takeaways will be, how the book's put together. And finally, they've got a call to action that says what next. And then on the bottom there, we've got some social proof that tells us why they're credible to teach us this in the first place. But I bet if most of us took this framework and looked at our own websites, it would look more like this. All of a sudden, we see some gigantic gaps in the information that we've put together. For example, this page does a good job of saying it's a new ebook. I give it a pass on that. It's good enough that it's an ebook. They don't explain who this is for. I was really generous in giving them the question, why should I care? Because they've got about 10 words that say one thing you'll learn in this book. Absolutely nothing that tells us why we should trust them. And then a big giant button where if we decide to trust them anyways, hey, we can download this. We can go for it. But there was a problem with this framework. And that is, if you think back to your last conversation, it probably had a logical flow. So for example, if you came up to me and said, Joel, what do you do? And I said, I have 10,000 customers. And then you said, yeah, OK, but how will that make my life better? And I said, sign up today. The problem is I'm answering your questions, but not in the order you're asking them. I'm not having a conversation with you. I'm forcing my facts on you. I'm not making this a conversation. I'm monologuing at my own terms. So if you want to make this framework useful, you have to think about it logically. What are the questions that need to be answered first before they're ready to have those next questions answered? So as a rough flow, 
If your lead doesn't leave your hero section understanding why they should care about what you're offering them, what it actually is, and if it's for them, you lose. You've already taken steps backwards. Then once you've gotten that buy-in from there, you've answered those questions, now you have the ability to get into how their life will improve, or how it works, or why they should trust you. And finally, once you've answered all those questions, now you can show them, okay, here's what happens next. Now I'm not presenting this like, hey, calls to action in the hero are bad, that's not the case. But what I want you to think about is, are we answering the questions people need to have answered before they're willing to do something? And if there's a marketer in this room that really gets that, it's Will Reynolds, and I'm so excited that you guys get to watch him tomorrow morning. Even if you drink too much, please, please, please show up, because that talk is gonna give so much context to all of this. So how do we get answers to those questions? How do we make it all meaningful? Well, here we have a problem too, especially if you're an SEO, because in SEO and especially other marketing disciplines, we tend to look at our leads as these outlines, these things that we've drawn and we try to shove real people into them. So they're the people we wish our customers were. But for copy, it's not useful really to know that, oh, they're a 40-year-old marketing director who makes 60 grand a year and it's a single mom who drives a minivan and looked for a recipe for cherry pie. None of that is helpful in tapping into motivation. And motivation is what we really need to understand if we want to write copy that converts. The why behind all of those queries, the because that's not usually attached. You know, so someone might search for gym gear, but why do they want that gym gear? Maybe it's because their old gym gear was uncomfortable and they're trying to get back in shape. We don't get to see that because if we stop at the search query, if we never talk to these people. So there's four things that we need to understand if we're gonna to get to the heart of motivation. We need to understand our customers' pain points. We need to understand their anxieties. We need to understand the priorities because not all anxieties and pain points are created equal. And then we need to understand the outcomes they're coming to us for. So you might read that list and go, great, we know those things, I'm gonna hop right in. But there's a problem with that. And I wanna illustrate it this way. Let's play a simple game. I want you to watch and tell me the difference between the copy on the left and the copy on the right. So on the left we have sales made simple. And on the right we have you hate guesswork and busy work, so we made sales less work. What about this? Affordable time tracking payroll software. Ah, that's sexy stuff, right? Or the time tracking tool that pays for itself. What about this? Breakthrough native reporting limitations. Now I was on this project and even I don't know what that means. It's like it was tossed out of an angry jargon robot. And then on the right we've got get the reports your CRM can't give you without the headaches it does. And I think if we're honest, most of us would agree that the copy on the left is more generic, cliched, it doesn't really pack an emotional punch. It's boring. And the copy on the right is more specific, interesting, human. Well, I mentioned there was a problem earlier, and this is it. All of the copy on the left was written by marketers and copywriters from real projects, and all of the copy on the right is almost verbatim pulled from customers. So am I out of a job? The problem is that you are not your customer. So stop trying to think for them and start talking to them. So real quick, I'm gonna cover three different tactics, three different tools to gather the information you need. I'm gonna show you how to organize it to make it useful, and then I'm gonna tell you what to look for and wrap it all up with a case study that makes it all real. So, three different ways that we can talk to our customers. The first is customer interviews, and I love this because this is the deepest dive you can possibly take of any channel, because you're face-to-face -face or on the phone, and you have the ability to ask why. Why is the single most important question you can ask when trying to gather customer insights? Then email surveys. And I love email surveys because you can collect mass feedback at scale. It's less personal than an interview, so you need to choose your questions carefully. But you can quantify qualitative things, especially good for priorities. For example, what feature is most important to your leads? When they're evaluating you, what almost kept them from buying? What comes up over and over again? It's much easier to recognize patterns with mass feedback at scale. And finally, reviews and testimonials. And I love them because they're free, and you don't need a whole lot of them to start gathering some really interesting information. But that's not good enough. 
how do we know what questions to ask and when? If I just told you, yeah, go do an email survey, you could go blast out a terrible email survey, learn nothing, and then come back next year and say, what you told me was totally useless. So there's a structure. What we want to get to when we're talking about motivation is people's experience, not their opinion. We're not looking for opinions, we're looking for experiences. That means getting people to tell us their story. And the way that we do that is by as asking questions in a logical format. What was going on before they came to us? What was their experience like working with our product or service? And then what happened after? We need to get them to share the narrative of their decision. So I'm going to share eight questions that across thousands of survey respondents and hundreds of interviews have proven to be really effective at capturing the information that we need. And the wording here is really important. So first, for capturing pain points, what was going on in your business or in your life that sent you looking for a solution? So instead of someone saying, oh, we needed a new time tracking software, now they're telling you about the problems that they have that sent them looking for something like you. What else did you try and what didn't you love about it? Most marketers stop at what else did you try and they get this list of comparators like, great, we know who we're up against. Well, while you're talking to them, ask them what they didn't love about it. That's your pain point that you can solve better than your competitor can. For anxieties, what almost kept you from buying from us? What almost stopped you from making the decision to work with us? Or if you want to flip this to a positive, which tends to get really great responses as well, what made you confident enough to give us a try? What was it about us that made you go, hmm, you know what, I think these people can be trusted. That is a powerful insight to have when you're structuring your copy. When we're talking about priorities, what made blank the best solution for you? So again, what was it about us that made us better than the competition? What priority did we meet that other competitors just couldn't? And then when evaluating blank, whether it's industry or solution or whatever, what was most important to you, especially powerful when used in surveys to gather hierarchies of priorities? What can you do now or do better than you could before? Please never ask your customer, what have your results been? Because they won't know. They won't know what to tell you. They'll be grasping at straws. Ask them what they can do now or do better than they could before. And if you want even better insights, follow this question up with, and what has that meant for you? What has that meant for other departments? And finally, give me an example of when blank, your product or service, made a difference for you. Again, get them telling a story that brings context to all those features and benefits that make your product matter. So you can go out and you can ask these questions, but the problem is you're only going to be as good as your analysis. So really quickly, there's a downloadable template that you can use when gathering this information to make it meaningful. And there's a link there that you can go download this and a whole schwack of other resources that I'm going to talk about. But the gist of this slide is copy and paste the quote, classify it as whether it's a benefit, a pain point, an anxiety so that you can group them later. If there's themes that emerge, you want to classify those there so all the quotes come up together. If it's tied to a feature, mention that. Take notes on why you like that quote because I promise some of them you will forget why you pulled that in the first place. And then the single most important column next to the quote itself, where you found it, so that you can go back and get context on it later. Because when you're doing this over a hundred different things, it's really easy to lose quotes. So what are we actually looking for in these responses? The first thing is frequently used words. What words do your customers say over and over and over again, talking about themselves, talking about you, their problems, their benefits? Because if they use those words, you probably should too. Look for recurring themes. These are real responses to a survey we did for Inside Squared. So because of Inside Squared, we've been able to close higher value deals on a faster timeline than before. KPIs used to be a time consuming part of my workflow. It saves me time every morning. We saw time coming up again and again and again as a theme and we could work with that. Look for things that are well said. So instead of saying we can analyze data better, we can twist, turn and dig into every aspect of the sales process. And instead of, oh, the learning curve is short, yeah, that's not bad, but you could literally turn your sales intelligence on tomorrow. You'll know these because when you read them, they hit you in the gut. It feels different when you read this kind of response. And lastly, look for quotes that are insightful, that reveal that hidden because that I mentioned earlier. It has very detailed reporting, somewhat useful. Why does that matter? 
because before everyone fought over what the true booking number was, but now it's a given. This is a problem we didn't even know customers had, internal conflicts over numbers. And now that we know they have it, we can talk about how we solve it, and none of the competitors are talking about that. So I want to wrap this up by showing you a case study of how we brought this all together in real life. So I was brought in to work on the HubSpot.com CRM page as a small project with Matt Barbie. And we took this exact process. So we first we conducted an email survey of existing clients, getting them to classify who they are, how they use the software, what was most important to them. Then we mined reviews and testimonials out in the wild. And one of the most important things I can tell you here is don't just mine your own testimonials. Go read your competitors' bad reviews. Because not only is it great whiskey reading, it's fantastic for figuring out what you can solve that people are frustrated with about your competitor and put that front and center and say, hey, we do this better. Then we reviewed interview transcripts. So the HubSpot team had already talked to a pile of customers. We poured over those to see how people talk about the problem, the solution, over and over. And finally, check out your chat logs. If you're not running live chat on your site, commit to running it for just one week. Give it resources for just one week because it's an anxieties gold mine. No other channel is going to tell you the problems your leads don't think are being solved on your landing pages or website quite like a chat log because the questions that come up over and over again aren't being answered in your copy. So answer them in your copy. So there's a few things we learned. The first thing was that customers cared about different things than we do. The features and benefits that the internal team thought were the most important weren't exactly the ones that the customer talked about the most or even said were most important to them. And that was interesting. And then the serum was heavily marketed on the word free. And yes, that's a huge selling point. But free wasn't even the biggest part of the equation when we talked to customers. There were other more compelling reasons they signed on. And then we learned that some tasks were common to all segments, some outcomes every segment wanted to have. Everyone in every group mentioned these as things they wanted to achieve. But some benefits were unique to decision makers. And if you're going to only write a page for one person, write it for the person who can actually buy from you instead of all the people who might go, oh, this is interesting. So here's what we did. We changed the messaging to mirror the priorities and pain points of the audience we'd talked to. Instead of pushing on the word free, we changed it to an outcome that came up over and over again. Close more deals with less work. And that came literally verbatim from feedback from a customer. Then we moved from features to benefits. So on the old site, we talked a lot about customizing views, deal and task boards, being in sync with the platform. We changed that to talk about, here's why you're going to love the HubSpot CRM. You can learn it in minutes, not months. And you can automate the boring stuff. And you can track every interaction you have with the customer. And yep, that stuff's all directly stolen from customers too. Then we restructured the landing pages based on customer priorities. The things that they told us were most important to them got talked about first, instead of the things that internal teams or that the copywriters thought we should really push this, it's important. We let customers define that. We let the customer drive. And then we use those customer outcomes that we learned to write better crossheads to make it more enticing to pick this up and work with it. So, hey, you can see your entire pipeline at a glance. You can customize deal stages to your sales process. Well, as a result, we saw a 20% increase in signups to the CRM, which is no small number when you're dealing with that volume of traffic. And Matt Barbie, who's a real person and is here and speaks later this week, can verify that if you go and ask him. So that got us buying internally to do a larger project. When HubSpot was redesigning the site, we used this same copy framework to overhaul the copy. And in working in tandem with their design and their new sign-up flow, we doubled HubSpot's site-wide conversion rate. We doubled their inbound call volume. We saw a 35% increase in demo requests and 27% more product signups. And if you take nothing else away from this session today, take this slide away. This is the power of shutting up and listening to your customers and then taking the words that they're saying and putting them into your own copy. Thank you guys so much. This has been a dream come true to talk at MozCon, so thank you guys very much. <laughs>